morning, pastor and congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. Thank you for inviting me today to make a presentation before you. I'm Cheryl Howard, and I'm here as the president of the African American Heritage Society Incorporated. We are a state recognized 501c3 organization and also a West Florida United Way certified partner agency. The African American Heritage Society was founded September 12, 1990, and has operated continuously with vision and purpose for 30, going on 31 years. We're located in the heart of the historical district at 200 Church Street, and we have been there since 2000. Prior to that, from 1990 to 2000, we were located at the Pensacola Cultural Center, also in the historical district across the street from the T.T. Whitworth Museum. Our mission is to preserve, promote, educate, and integrate African-American heritage, history, culture, and diversity in Pensacola and the greater Gulf Coast region, and to continue to lead the area in supporting and promoting cultural tourism and social justice through education and the humanities. Through quality programming, the African American Heritage Society has offered retrospective exhibits in the visual arts and humanities, performing arts programs, cultural festivals, as well as educational lectures, all highlighting a broad spectrum of the African American experience, its unique and creative influences, and contributions to American life. For our 30th season, we wanted to find a way to provide a more complete history of the African American experience in America as we are fully American. We say in all of our lectures and events that American history and African American history are the same. It took place on the same soil and events and the, the events and the lives of all of the inhabitants occurred in conjunction with the birth and development of this nation. Yet somehow a large portion of the history is not taught in the traditional way within a classroom setting. Much of what American citizens know or believe that they know has been passed down within their families and depending upon the ancestral history may or may not be accurate. We believe that this lack of knowledge is at the root of many of the divisions that our country has been plagued with for so long. Therefore, when we were presented with the opportunity to further curate an exhibit that had been initially created by the New York Historical Society, we were elated. The initial exhibit was to explore African American history during the age of Jim Crow, which began post-slavery and after the short period of time that we consider to be a period of almost true freedom, uh, more commonly known as the period of Reconstruction. That period was a brief 12 years, and then we were ushered into the period of Jim Crow, which is pretty much where the country has remained more or less in various forms ever since. Recognizing that most of the history that is embraced during Black History Month in February is usually focused primarily on the civil rights movement and great human beings such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. While we honor those wonderful legends and uh, leaders within the civil rights movement, we believe that it's important to provide a more broad-based training or education, if you will, about the history of America and the African American experience, particularly slavery and the time period before, periods before and after that. So with the blessing of the historic University of West Florida Historic Trust with whom we are partners and the New York Historical Society, we were able to expand the initial eight panel exhibit to include the period uh, predating the arrival of enslaved people to America, starting with the origins on the continent of Africa. And then we move forward from there through the Middle Passage to the transatlantic slave trade and go all through all of the various periods of our time here 
um, in America up to the present time. We believe that an exhibit such, a bit, such as this is long overdue because the majority of our exhibits are based on short periods of time. It is unfortunate that it took the death of a human being, George Floyd, and the overlapping presence of a deadly pandemic to bring the world's attention to social injustices that have been endured by millions of human beings for the crime of having been born with melanin in our skin. We are often taught that the body is merely the housing for the soul. I can't imagine that our souls would be very different as I imagine it to be a light that shines within us all. Yet prior to this social justice awakening, so many lights were dimmed or extinguished by having been deemed not worthy because of the outer shell. Our exhibit provides the historical facts with pictures for those who are more visual and words, as well as, as all of the exhibits are documented as well with um, the historical basis, the research, so that one can continue their own research additionally should they choose to do so. So I'd like to invite you to uh, enjoy, to the extent that you can, um, the uh, exhibit that will be presented next. Um, I want to also invite you, recognizing that we are in a pandemic, to consider visiting uh, Voices of Pensacola to see the exhibit live. Uh, I would recommend that you call ahead to make sure that it is not a day in which uh, we have an inordinate number of people waiting in line. Uh, we have been very successful with uh, keeping the numbers within Voices down to two or three people as they move through the exhibit. Uh, also, for, for those uh, interested and who are within a certain age group, we are offering small exhibits as well, uh, small tour groups to, ex to, um, to see the exhibit as well. And that, of course, is based upon uh, an appointment. So please uh, feel free to give us a call. Um, our website is A-A-H-S Pensacola dot org. So without further ado, I'd like to once again thank you so very much for inviting me to tell you a little bit about the African American Heritage Society and to, uh, to tell you about our 30th season exhibit that we are so pleased to be a part of and to have had the opportunity to co-curate and um, to say thank you for your anticipated generosity. Uh, whatever resources that you provide, I assure you, will be put to good use. Um, unfortunately, interest in African American history or the lives even of currently of African American people tend to go in and out of fashion and it waxes and wanes. So we have good years and we have not so great years. So we hope that this time this is not just a moment, but that it is in fact a movement and that we will be moving forward as we seek social justice for all of mankind without any shame to those who may be the descendants of slave owners and absolutely no shame to those who are the descendants of enslaved people. We are all basically concerned about understanding and hoping that that understanding will lead to better relationships for all of us as we share this great earth. Thank you. So I'd like to invite you to walk along with me as I just point out the various panels that make up this 24 panel exhibit. <clears throat> and in order to see it more closely, you are invited to tour the exhibit live at Voices of Pensacola, directly across the street from Signal Quarter. We have an excellent uh, intern, uh, executive assistant, excuse me, there, Francine, who gives most of the tours, and she is requested because she does such an amazing job. So I would ask you to please consider a small tour uh, group 
group even after hours if you're concerned about being in a public space with the COVID. But I can tell you that we have been very careful and only allowing two to three people at a time. Mm -hmm. So we have not had any incidences uh, as of yet and hope that we will not. But we will certainly accommodate you. One of the reasons that we're pleased to have this opportunity is that we, if we are able to secure additional funding, we'd like to expand the days that we are able to provide private tours uh, outside of the public viewing time. But that, of course, calls for additional funding for staff. So please follow along with me now. I won't have a chance to get a full dissertation about each of the panels, but I can at least show you what they look like and so that you can have a preview of what we, you will see if you are able to visit us at Voices. Thank you very much. This is our introductory panel here. This one explains the, the relationship between our exhibit and the university. This is the panel that I talked about, which starts the discussion of African-American people still on the continent of Africa and to tell what we were doing before being enslaved and brought to America and the other parts of the Americas and Europe. This, this panel depicts the Middle Passage, which was an arduous journey, as you can see, these are human beings laying, laid next to each other, back side by on their sides, um, in chains, all the way around, and they traveled this way for approximately three to four months. Those that lived, many died in the, along the way. This panel discusses the transatlantic transportation and also how it was determined where various slaves would be taken, whether or not they would be taken to, the, uh, to North America, where more cotton and rice was grown, or if they would be taken to the West Indies, where sugar was refined and cultivated. The next one talks about the fact that slavery existed in all 13 colonies uh, before we were America, when we were the colonies. It existed uh, from New England all the way down to Georgia. This talks about the many billions of dollars that the free labor provided by slaves made for the South. The History Channel has opined that if the Confederacy had been its own separate nation, it would have ranked as the fourth richest in the world at the start of the Civil War. And because we are in the South, and many of us are very fond of the movie Gone with the Wind, it tells a story that is not the complete story uh, and so we have titled this one, Not a Gone with the Wind Experience. Many believed that slavery and the uh, physical punishment was visited only upon the male slaves. But as you can see, many females were beaten and uh, treated in the same fashion, as well as children. <laughs> This depicts the Civil War, talks about um, the life of Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith. And it's, it starts when he's a runaway from slavery and known by the Union soldiers as contraband. And then it shows him signing up for the military service. And then at the end of the Civil War, returning home, not as a complete person in the sense of his body having lost a leg, fighting for his own freedom. And then again, this one talks about the Dred Scott decision and how Dred Scott had sued for freedom from slavery 
and the court, the United States Supreme Court in 1857 found that he and his wife were in fact not, um, were not to be freed, that they were not considered to be human beings entitled to such freedom. This is a poem that was written by Langston Hughes in 19, I believe it was 36. And it is so interesting how so many individuals feel that the same things that he spoke of then apply today um, when there's an issue of democracy and the Jim Crow and the feeling of being left out and not having an opportunity to fully compete and be a member of American society. While meanwhile, we did participate and have participated in every war since the Civil War. And then we talk about the period of Reconstruction that started in 1865. This is the period that I spoke of that really spanned approximately 12 years. And that was the period of time in which there was an actual attempt to um, integrate African Americans into the nation and into the world in terms of having access to all of the same rights as any other citizen. And that period, as I mentioned, was very short-lived. Talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, during slavery, it was not uncommon for children to be separated from their parents from birth or at age two or four, 10, 15, whatever, whenever it was deemed uh, necessary or desirable to sell uh, a person uh, from their, their parent. Often uh, the children were sold from their mothers when, as a, a wedding gift, for example, to the uh, slave master's um, children to help them start their plantation and so on. And so here, even after the Emancipation Proclamation, you can see that many slaves were still unable, although they were technically free, they were unable to live because they basically were released from, from slavery, enslavement, with no money, no land, only the clothes that they were wearing, and nothing else. So the question became, how free are you? if you really are not able to provide for yourself and your family. Um, also, as I mentioned before, it says 32 years in search of a wife tells the story of a gentleman whose wife had been sold away from he and their children. And at the end of slavery, after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, he spent 32 years looking for his wife. And when he and his adult children by then found her, they talked about the big reunion that they had and how they wept for joy. And here the priorities of freedom, once people were freed, what things were important to them. Voting was certainly an issue. Democracy and equality, the pursuit of happiness, liberty, life, all of these things were important. And then we talk about how uh, at one point during that 12 year reconstruction period when the, everyone was able to participate equally with democracy, many uh, individuals went on to become um, uh, senators, uh, representatives in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Um, but that ended between uh, 1870 and 1877 um, after an agreement uh, between the, different, the, the North and the South and their political representatives, which then turned back the clock and basically restored the same order and the same people were consigned back to the plantations and the people who had previously owned them without protection of the federal government. And then we see violence anew and then the advent, again, of lynching and rioting, massacring of African-American people. It became a phenomenon uh, that people would take pictures of the lynched individual and have them put on postcards and mail them all around the country 
to their relatives to show what sort of recreation they had had on Sunday after church. And then we move to the period of Jim Crow, which is basically, I consider to be essentially of the federalized legal state of a caste system, essentially, where it is perfectly okay for large segments of the population to be excluded from having any of the rights of any other person, once again, because of melanin in the skin. And then those who could move from the South, seeking to flee this caste system by going north, did do so. And when they arrived in the north, Unfortunately, a different form of Jim Crow awaited them there. But to some extent, it was a little less frightening because at least they were not as likely to at least be lynched. So it, it gave them some sense of satisfaction that they could at least live, although in many cases in certain parts of the country that was not necessarily true. But as you can see, the South lost a great many African-American people during the great first Great Migration from 1910 to 1940, and again during the second migration from 1940 to 1970. People looking for a better life, which led then to the building of Black Harlem. Uh, many people are not aware that Harlem was not always um, a place of African-Americans. It gradually became so because this gentleman, <clears throat> Philip Payton, began to purchase real estate there uh, so that the large numbers of African Americans moving to Harlem could find safe housing. And so people came there from the South and the Caribbean uh, just, just looking for a safe place to live and work and raise their families. And then we have the challenging Jim Crow, which led to sort of has been ongoing, but really met its stride with the civil rights movement. And I wonder, I wonder sometimes uh, when I see history like this that was put out by the Dallas County Citizens Council of Selma, Alabama, asking its white citizens, what have I personally done to maintain segregation? And it goes through and talks about the importance of every white person to do whatever it can to basically disenfranchise people of color. And then we have the new Jim Crow that we're living under now, which is various forms of social injustice, not the least of which are the, is the mass incarceration and private prisons. Here in this area, we have the issue of direct file as well. And so this is not our final slide, but it's the final one that's listed here right now. And it's the Black Lives Matter and affirmation of that fact with a picture, of course, of George Floyd. And we have a... a Final slide, but it isn't here today. We're doing some tweaking and adjusting. So when you come in to tour, um, by that time, I'm hopeful that you will have the opportunity to see the final slide. So I think I am more than out of time now. I hope that this has been um, enlightening. Um, I hope that you will uh, be able to visit us either on our website, AA, that's like African American, AAHSPensacola.org, to follow along with our lecture series, our book club series, as well as a quarterly music accompaniment and lectures to further textualize this exhibit and tell you more about what we are trying to do to help with no blame to those who might be the descendants of slave, owner, uh, slave owners and no shame uh, for those who are the descendants of enslaved people. 
but just seeking to inform and to educate and to provide facts and information so that we can move forward, hopefully, in a more uh, united way for the rest of the time that we inhabit this earth. Thank you so much again.